Hello friends, welcome to the St. Michael stream. My name is Father Charles, I am the vicar here. And today we are looking at Luke 17, verses 1 to 9, how we need each other if we are going to get to heaven. We will conclude with a few practical and easy steps to add a little discipline to your life in the next several weeks to start living like you want to get to heaven. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. As always, if this ministry is a blessing in your life, please consider a financial contribution using the link in the description. Now let's get to it. How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Depends on the type of Christian. How many charismatic Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Five. One to change the light bulb and four to bind the spirit of darkness in the room. How many Calvinists? None. The Lord is predestined when the light should go on. How many Baptists? No, at least 15. One to actually change the light bulb, plus three committees to approve the changing of the light bulb, and at least one person to bring a potato salad. Finally, how many Episcopalians does it take to change the light bulb? Ten. One to call the electrician, and nine others to complain about how much better the old light bulb was. This one hits hard for me. One, I don't love it when things change. And we used to actually call an electrician to change light bulbs when I first came to St. Michael's. I kid you not. Now, these jokes poke fun at the different charisms or peculiarities of different groups of our brothers or sisters. But they also illustrate a cutting and important truth about what it means to follow Jesus. How many Christians does it take to get to heaven? All of them. You just simply cannot get there by yourself. You need your brothers and sisters with you to make the trip. We need each other. And the holy season of Lent demands that we start walking with each other toward heaven. As we begin the Lenten season, we join with Jesus and his disciples on a journey to Jerusalem and to the cross. This is a journey about we've been hearing about for several weeks now in the gospel lessons since Luke 9, when Jesus and the disciples turn emphatically towards Jerusalem. So we turn now our attention towards Jerusalem and the cross, and we join Jesus and the disciples in the midst of their journey to Jerusalem and the cross, and we embark on our Lenten journey. Lent is a season of preparation. We are getting ready for the horror of Holy Week, for the murder and self-sacrifice of God upon a shameful instrument of torture, for the redemption of the world. Our Lenten journey culminates in the great celebration of Jesus' resurrection and the destruction of sin and death with great expectation of the great and last day when we shall see Jesus face to face. But before Easter, and the joy of the resurrection and Jesus' return, we must first go on to Jerusalem and to that cross. Jesus and the disciples walking this path for some time, and over that time, we can see Jesus' actions switch from healings and other larger public signs to teaching in smaller group settings, both with his intimate followers and the wider public. The disciples and the wider public who are receiving Jesus' teaching are always together when they receive the teaching. This togetherness is not an accident. In Luke 17, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, specifically after teaching to a more public audience in Luke 16. With the parable of the shrewd manager and of Lazarus and the rich man, check out the last two weeks' sermons on YouTube if you missed these, Jesus is making the point that what we do with our money matters. It is important. We are either investing in earthly wealth or heavenly wealth. In Luke 17, Jesus takes the stewardship lesson on money and turns it to how we use people and are used by them. Hence the question, how many Christians does it take to get to heaven? Well, Jesus begins by telling his disciples that temptations to sin are sure to come. Fair enough. Temptation to sin lurks in many places. For some of us, the keyboard gives a bit too much courage. And email or social media tempts us into sin. For others, it is money or status 
or silks or alcohol or, or, or. As we heard about last week, we are just addicted to sin. And overcoming that addiction is about first admitting we have a problem, which is what our Lenten journey is supposed to help us to do. The second step is to avoid the temptation of just needing to try or work harder. Now, that is oh so tempting. And thus we dream up things to give up for Lent, using the power of our own might so that we can try harder and break the addiction of sin. But that is just our pride and addiction talking. We must admit that we are powerless against sin. There is no health in us, as we were reminded of in Psalm 38. Then we must repent and return to the Lord, seeking forgiveness and amendment of life. Man, Jesus sure does know what he's talking about there, because that temptation to sin is even present in trying to break free of sin. But Jesus warns, woe to the one through whom the temptations come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, he were cast into the sea, than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Now, this woe, which really means grief or hardship, in the Greek it is the word oai, there is grief and hardship when we lead our brothers or sisters into sin because they were counting on us to help them to get to heaven. We are responsible for them. This is seen most powerfully in the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, where the father asks Cain where his brother Abel is. And those in the know know that Cain murdered his brother in rage. So Cain asks the father if he is his brother's keeper, to which the response is, yeah, Cain, you are. The whole covenantal community of Israel in the Old Testament is built upon this idea that we together are the people of God. We are to be our brother's keepers. The early church from the biblical era on understood this well, which is why they were so keen on church discipline, because we need each other to get to heaven. I had better help keep you out of sin, and you help keep me out of sin, or woe with grief and hardship to me and to you for the sins of our brothers and sisters who we failed to help. This is why in Acts 2 and 4 we see the church intentionally holding everything in common and providing for everyone's needs. We are in this together. And if your brother or your sister sins against you, rebuke them so they might repent, says the Lord. And if they repent, forgive them. We need them if we are going to get to heaven. Our repentance is about restoring our relationship with God and about restoring our relationship with the community of the faithful people. The disciples then ask Jesus to increase their faith, and the communal nature of being with and following Jesus is emphasized again. It should come as a surprise to no one that following Jesus requires the hope God's very nature is community of love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the disciples say, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord responds to them, if you had faith like that of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, if you've been following along with me for any time, You'll know that I don't think the King James Version of the Bible is the best translation for most people to use. The language is difficult, and there are just way too many false friends, or words you think you know what they mean, but you don't. Check out Mark Ward on YouTube, where his book authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible for excellent work on this. There is a method to the madness in the ye and the and the KJV, and it's actually helpful once you know the trick. The pronouns that start with T's are second person singular. The pronouns that start with Y's are second person plural. So let's hear the disciples' plea again in the King James Version. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say to the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Let me make it even clearer, though, by translating this into the Southern Standard Version. The disciples said to the Lord, increase our faith. 
And the Lord said, if y'all had as much faith as would fit in a mustard seed, then y'all could say to the big old pine tree, be uprooted and planted in the ocean. It would obey y'all. The faith of the disciples is the disciples' faith. It's not the faith of one disciple and his or her own, but it is the faith of the disciples working and worshiping and praying and living together. That is so powerful. We need each other. Jesus then gives a warning to his disciples in Luke 17 here about the dynamics that can destroy the body of the faithful. And Satan wants to destroy cohesion with the body of Christ. That is the church. Because Satan knows that we need each other to get to heaven and getting us to focus on our own personal preferences and successes over and against the community is key to separating us from the Father. The Southern Standard Version will be helpful again. Jesus will say, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or creeping the critters say to him when he has come in from the field, Come right now and sit down to supper? Wouldn't you rather say to the servant, Make my supper and help me get ready and serve me while I eat and drink? After my supper, you can have yours. Do you think that servant, because he did what he was supposed to do? So when y'all have done what y'all were supposed to have done, say, we are your humble servants. We have just done what we were supposed to have done. Again, notice, thank you, Southern Standard Version, how we are to think and of and refer to ourselves as part of the servants of God. Each of us is one of the Lord's servants who together do the work of the gospel. We are each needed to do our bit for the whole. And when any one of us lets the rest of us down, everyone is worse off for it. Furthermore, the temptation to pride and to call out how particularly good or great I am over and against the body of the faithful causes division within the body. As followers of Jesus, we are to work together to do our duty for the gospel. It is in living this way that we find our blessing. We need each other to hold one another accountable. And we are held accountable for the blessing or curse we are in our brother and sister's lives. During this Lenten season, the church and the Holy Spirit call us to pay more attention to how we are living. We are called to fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. And our Lenten discipline it's not about any of us just giving up chocolate or trying to be a bit more prayerful, but about how we, all of us together, can use these 40 holy days to become more like Jesus. Now, prayer, the perfect example of it is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is somewhat of a misnomer because it is not the prayer of our Lord, but rather the prayer our Lord is teaching us to pray. Way back in Luke 11, we find the Lord's Prayer. You probably already know how it goes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our prayer is to first address God as our Father. Our prayer is to recognize our Father is holy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer asks God to work out his perfect will in our lives. Our prayer is all about changing us to become like Jesus, to act in all things that we do, in accordance with our Father's will. Give us this day our daily bread. Our prayer asks our Father to provide for our daily needs. We are to trust the Father will totally provide for all that we need, and he does. Within the community of the church, there is more than enough resources to meet the needs of the faithful. That's the good news. The harder part of the good news is that the resources to do this are in our bank accounts, the people of God need each other. It is through one another as the church that the Father provides for our needs. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Our prayer is to ask our Father to forgive us as we are already forgiving others for their sins. Prayer and the alignment of our will with the will of the Father is the same thing. The confession and repentance for sin is to God. But as we read about in James 5, it is also to be for one another. We need each other's forgiveness. Confession and repentance is about improving our relationship with God and each other. We need each other. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Finally, our prayer asks our Father to keep us, even from the temptation to sin. 
We need each other to do this. In the book of Acts, which is the second part of Luke's gospel account, chapter 2, beginning with the 42nd verse, we see a description of the church powerfully witnessing to the gospel and introducing people to Jesus. The faithful are sharing life together, worshiping and praying together daily. We need each other. The biblical expectation, the church's expectation, is that people are working and eating and praying together and for one another daily. So how can you structure your life like this as a discipline of the season of Lent? Well, could your discipleship group or a few friends do a daily FaceTime or group call or coffee or text for prayer? Fasting. No, simply put, fasting is just reducing or eliminating food or something else from your life for a certain period of time. This is different than just not having chocolate or coffee or alcohol or whatever it is you're giving up. Fasting is not an individual activity, but an activity of the community as a way of humbling ourselves before God. In the biblical witness, we see fasting as an activity of the people of faith together as a means to humble ourselves before the Lord. Fasting is about the people of God listening more intently to the will of God to conform their lives together and their daily lives to the will of the Father. Our fasting flows back into our prayer. So how might you fast like this? Well, what if we as a people gave up snippy behavior? What if we as a people gave up our own personal preferences in service to the gospel and helping each other to become holier, ready to greet Jesus when he walks upon the earth again? Finally, almsgiving. It's a fancy way of saying giving money over and above the tithe, specifically to assist the poor and the needy amongst us. This is again an object of community discipleship and discipline. It keeps with the Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 ethic of holding all things in common. It is beautiful when done because it means the church has the resources to bear up the needs of our community. Remember from the Lord's Prayer that our Father has already provided for all our needs providing the church and the faithful with abundant resources. Are we going to use and deploy them well? well? We need each other. Here are a few ways to do almsgiving during Lent. Holy helpers. This is where St. Michael's people volunteer time to help accomplish small projects around the homes of people known to our community who cannot get the work done themselves. We have four of the ten volunteers we need to begin taking requests. Speak with me. Chris Bias or Jamie Cole, if interested. But could you be called to almsgiving in this way? The St. Michael Angels Bank has helped five people in 2023 already. It provides food, toiletries, and other essentials to people from within our community who cannot afford them. We need people to bring in items, including non-perishable foods and fresh meats we can freeze. We also need people to help organize the donations. Speak with Joanne Vaughn or Kathy Brown, our preschool director and assistant director, or me, to begin giving alms this way. Finally, Burton Pack Elementary School receives food for 24 kids and their families every week. These families would not have good stuff and sufficient food to eat on the weekends without the ministry. We need people to shop and bring in non-perishable foods for this ministry. We also need financial donations to supplement the food people bring in. The ministry costs $600 a month to make it work. We need people to pack and deliver the food to help organize the pantry. Speak with Stan Dallinger, Alex Maitland, Debbie Molinex, or myself to begin giving alms this way. Quite frankly, our Lord is teaching us that we need each other, and it takes all of us walking together to get to heaven. Connect with us, and let's get going together.